Welcome to module 27 of point set topology part 1 of NPTEL course. Today we will give you a, an attempt to characterize neighborhoods in the case of co-induced topology. Finally this is going to be a negative result just to caution you what kind of results to expect and where one has to be careful and so on. So, remember open subsets of a coherent topology have the property that intersection with each member of the family if some set has the property that intersection with each member of the family is open in that set then the set itself is open. So, can we have similar characterization for neighborhoods? That is the question. So, put uh, in a straightforward way, let us look at this proposition here, which later on actually we will show that this is a wrong proposition. This actually has no uh, basis. Basis is just because uh, we think that open subsets have such nice uh, characterization, why not neighborhoods? So, take this uh, somewhat special case, not not very special, but uh, easy case. Namely, suppose x has been written as union of some subspaces x i, subsets x i, each of x i is a closed subspace of x i plus 1, the next one. So, it is an increasing union. Okay, and it's countable because I have uh, put them as integers here. And x is given the coherent topology with respect to the family of subspaces xi. It just means that a subset of x is open in this coherent topology filled on if its intersection with each xi is open in xi. Okay, now suppose B is an arbitrary subset of x contained in another arbitrary subset W, okay, such that for each indexing here, each index here i, if you intersect W with x i, that is a neighborhood of B intersection x i in x i. Remember, each x i is already a closed subspace to begin with of the next x i plus 1 and so on. Then we have taken x as the union of x i and putting the coherent topology on x. Under this situation, we would like to say that w is a neighborhood of b in x. Okay. So, this is simpler case, you can expect such a thing if it is true for arbitrary union instead of increasing union and so on. Even in this case, simplest case, it is false. So, that is the gist of today's talk. So, I repeat a subset W is called a neighborhood of A if there is an open subset U such that A is contained inside U is contained inside W. This is similar to neighborhood of a point. If this A is a singleton set then it is a neighborhood of that point. So, that can be uh, generalized to neighborhoods of any set source. In the statement of the above proposition, if you replace the word neighborhood by open sets or open neighborhood, then the statement follows directly from the definition of coherent topology. Indeed, using the definition of coherent topology, we are trying to get the same criteria for neighborhoods also. That is the whole idea. However, this proposition is hopelessly wrong. As you will see, by the following simple counter example below. So, why I am giving you this one? First of all, to caution you with certain kind of results. This proposition occurs in some very standard literature on CW complexes. Okay. 
the, the classical uh, book is Lundell and Wiengram, uh, which had come in 1969, a very standard book, very highly respected book, which uh, CW Complex etc. I properly studied from this book also. And the same kind of mistake, actually the same proposition occurs in my own book also, 2014, uh, page number 91. So in this, this result is used in proving some other results about CW complexes, especially when you are studying product of two CW complexes. Luckily, those results can be proved directly without using this proposition. Uh, that is luck because this proposition is wrong now, as I will show you right now. Okay. So, one more remark on this. In those attempts in proving the above proposition, in at least in those two sources which I have quoted just now, the mistake occurs when one implicitly and erroneously assumes the following statement which is also wrong. So, you can supply easy examples of uh, counter examples for the statement. Namely, take two subsets A and Y of a topological space X, then interior of A intersection Y with respect to Y, that means inside the topological subspace Y as a subspace of X is contained in the interior of A as a subspace of x. So, this suffix denotes here x and y, you know where we are taking the interior. Interior of a subset is contained in the interior of a larger set, that is the correct thing. However, the interior where it is taken that is important. So, if you have taken subspace here and a larger space here, then there is no containment in general. In other words, take a subset of a smaller space, an interior point in the smaller space may fail to be an interior point in the larger space. Very easy examples you have seen such things, right? For example, even in the case of a, a real numbers, if you take a half closed interval 0 to 1, 0 closed, in that 0 to 1, 0 is also an interior point. However, 0 is not an interior point of 0 closed 1 as a subspace of the entire real numbers. So, so this is what you have to know. Okay, So, there are easy examples of this. So, such mistakes one should not make, which is uh, <laughs> when you tell somebody it is obvious, but you know, it's, 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 such things can occur while proving something you say, now we can verify this one and so on, that is your problem. So, however, let us not bother about uh, how this was wrong and so on, let us just directly prove that why this is wrong by just giving a counter example. So, here is the example, let R omega denote the set of all sequences of real numbers which are eventually 0 like 1, 2, 3, 4 and then 0, 0, 0, 0 ok 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.7 and so on and after 0, 0, 0 and so on finite sequences but sequences are all infinite but after a certain stage all of them are 0 ok so that is my R omega it is a vector space, no doubt. Take Xn to be all those sequences, real sequences, so Si is 0, I greater than equal to n plus 1 onwards, in a very specific subspace of R omega. Up to nth order, up to nth term, you can have any real number, after that it must be strictly 0, n plus 1, n plus 2, etc. So, that is my Xn this will be automatically a vector subspace of r omega and x itself which is r omega i am denoting this x now to be increasing union of xn's 
x1 we consist of only the first entry to be very free all other things are zero x2 will have first and second entry non zero and all other things are zero and so on so it's increasing union of x sense the under the usual topology r contained is r cross zero contained inside r cross r cross zero and so on right so these are all closed subspaces one is closed in the other x1 contains x2 contains x and so on xn will be closed in the xn plus 1 and so on okay in the standard euclidean topology for each xn give the coinduced topology tau on x from this collection clearly each xn is a closed subspace of this x tau also okay the induced topology Uh, uh, you know, from a closed family, automatically each member will be closed. That's all. Okay. Now I come to another subset here, S n. All those S in X n such that the norm, the Euclidean norm, okay, uh, the infinite norm I have take. Infinite norm is such maximum, right? Because x is S n, S S infinity is the same thing as maximum of modulus of S one, S two, S three up to S n. After that, everything is zero. So that norm is less than one by n, which just means that each entry is in modulus less than one by n. Okay, strictly less than one by n. So that is my S n. And take S to be the union of all these S n's, n ranging from one to infinity. Okay, so look at this one. This is an open subset of X n because the modulus is strictly less than one by n. Okay, so I have taken the union of these open subsets here. Okay, how does it look like? If you look at X one, which is real number, it is open interval from minus one to plus one. When you go to X two, this open interval This part will be still there, okay? Because I am taking x1 and x uh, x1 union x2, but x2 will be x2 will be what? Is open rectangle of side length my it will minus half to plus half or side length will be one minus half to plus half minus half to plus half product of those two open intervals. So that is your s2, but this is hanging out here, okay? It is from minus one to plus one. Now in S three, you will get an open Q from minus one third to plus one third of side two third, side length two third, and so on. So that is my picture of S S one, then S two, and then S three, and so on. Okay, the union of all these things is my S. All right. Then this S has the property that If you intersect with x n, that is a neighborhood of zero, zero in x n, zero 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 zero. That is in x n, zero zero zero. This zero, you can take all of them zero. That is zero here, which is a pop uh, zero of the vector space R omega itself, but it is the point of x n also. And this s intersection is a neighborhood of x n. Okay, for each n, we claim that. S C is not a neighborhood of zero in X. Okay, so go back to this picture. If you take S one, then it is automatically minus one plus one. If you take S two, you don't have to bother about this one. You can take just this uh, the half cube here. If you go to S three, uh, half uh, rectangle here. If you go to S three, you can take this uh, one third one third cube here and so on. Those are open subsets. So they are contained in the whole of uh, S1 union, S2 union, S3, or S intersection X n. So S intersection is a neighborhood of zero. Okay, but I want to say that S is not a neighborhood of zero. Okay, we claim that S is not a neighborhood of zero in the entire of X. All right. Suppose this is a neighborhood, then you have an open subset of X such that. Zero is in U, and U is contained inside S. Okay, this U is now open in X. 
then u intersection xn is an open subset of xn such that this u intersection x is contained as intersection xn because u is contained inside s okay note that the maximal open subset of xn which is contained in s intersection sn is just sn itself that means in s1 it is the open interval minus 1 plus 1 there is nothing more than that in s2 it will be this box this uh, rectangle open rectangle this portion goes away that is the maximal open subset in s3 it will be the open cube outside this open cube nothing is there okay <laughs> those are the maximal open subsets right for each of them so if there is some open subset they must be contained in mag this maximal open subset therefore the maximal open subset which is contained in this one is sn so therefore this u intersection xn must be inside sn for all n okay now this is not possible is order now let take s equal to s1 0 0 0 anything s1 is not zero that's all someone some neighbor will be there belong to you this implies s belongs to u intersection xn for all n as soon as some a member like this is there it must be inside u intersection xn for all n because this s1 is inside x1 right so it is inside x2 x3 x4 and so on. therefore s will be inside sn for all n but if s is sn for all n by the very definition of this sn what is it modulus of all these uh, entries must be less than 1 by n so this is true for all n that means mod s1 in particular must be less than 1 by n for all n therefore s is zero but that means u intersection x1 i have taken one point here in x1 and which belongs to you this is u intersection x1 is as soon as this is zero this s1 is zero it means this thing will turn zero okay which is not an open subset of x1 x1 remember is open interval from minus 1 to plus 1 so this proves that there is no such open subset okay which contains zero as well as contained inside our s so that is no such s is not an empty okay so uh, i have already cautioned you about why this is uh, necessary and so on so that is one thing is about co coherent topology etc you have to be careful indeed the problem can be of this kind of problems can occur even when you are dealing with boundary operator or closure operator so such a such a simplest uh, thing that i have elaborately taught you so you have to be careful about these operators our next topic is quotient spaces today we should just revise what is the meaning of a quotient function okay three different ways of looking at a quotient function is our topic just now and then next time we will uh, study the quotient spaces we will come to topology right now it is only set theoretic uh, property that we are going to just recall okay consider the following three concepts in set theory start with any given set x then take a surjective function from x to another set y that is the first thing the second is x itself is written as a mutually disjoint union of some of its non empty subsets okay indexed by some other set y so i am writing x as this disjoint union a y y inside y each a y is non empty a y intersection a y prime take any two of them that is empty whenever y is not equal to y prime so that is the second concept okay this has a name this is called partition of a set or a decomposition of a set 
which these two terms are used. Okay, so partition of x or typical decomposition of x. The third thing is we are given an equivalence relation on x. Okay, so these three concepts are mutually the same. They will give rise to one gives rise to another and another gives rise to one in a very uh, bijective way. That is precisely what we want to say that you will see that these three concepts are equivalent to each other. Okay. So let us see how. Start with a function from x to y which is a surjective function on to function. Then put a y equal to the fibers of q. 2 inverse y. y belong to y. Clearly a y will be disjoint. Being a surjective function, each q inverse y will be non empty also. Any point x will have to be mapped to some y here, and then it will be one of the q inverse y. Therefore, x will be the union of all these things. So that means that these a y's form a partition. Okay, so this is what I have said. So, next, given a partition x, like a y, y belong to y, each a y is non empty, union a y is x, and uh, a y intersection a y prime is empty. So that is an universe. We can define a relation on x as follows. This is the relation x1 is equivalent to x2 if and only if both x1 and x2 are in the same member here, a y. Okay? Verify that this is actually equivalence relation. That is not a big thing. So, if you see an equivalence relation, finally, suppose you have an equivalence relation, <coughs> we shall denote an equivalence class of an element of x by bracket x. Okay, I can also take q of x equal to bracket x, where set of all bracket x forms the set to y. Okay, what, what, what is y? y is a set of equivalence classes. Now what is qx? qx is the uh, equivalence class of x. So that is surjective function. So surjective function gives rise to a uh, partition, partition gives rise to an equivalence relation, equivalence relation gives rise to a surjective function. Nothing is lost in the cycle. If you start from one thing, concept, go through this cycle and come again, you will get back the original stuff wherever you stop. This is the precise the meaning of this. There is a triangle here, surjective functions, partition, equals relation. You can start from wherever you like. Say, let us say from here. I have a partition. I define the equivalence relation. Then I take the corresponding quotient map. Okay. Now I look at the partition, let us call them as B, B y's. But B y will be precisely equal to A y for each y and y. Okay. Where our y was precisely the original indexing set. How? Is what I want to show you. So start with y. Y has nothing to do with x. This is an indexing set. Here it is what? Here equivalence classes, the equivalence, here equivalence relations are there. Equivalence classes are just, if you take x1, bracket x1, okay, it will belong to a particular y, right? So that is the indexing set, that's a y. So that is what uh, a y is after all here, right? So now what I am taking, x going to the equivalence class, equivalence class is this a y. Right? So this is just y it will be. So qx will be just y. So that is why this y reappears here. So you can do the same thing, just start with freedom, don't worry about this one equivalence relation. Get a surjective function, get the partition. That partition will be precisely these equivalence classes. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show. All these three 
different manifests of just a subjective function here is important depending upon what we are interested in you should immediately shift your attention to uh, or your viewpoint to one of these three things okay <coughs> so that's what uh, i have summed up up here so the this is one of the things why a quotient function is called identification function also identification word comes from equivalence classes to uh, x1 is identified as x2 if we know this qx1 is equal to qx2 if we know if both x1 and x2 belong to a partition etc so you have two different uh, three different terminologies here okay one was what was that partition or decomposition the other one is identification space the third one is very simple a surjective function okay so all these things you should keep in mind okay one simple function theoretic property of the surjective function or equivalence relation is the following start with any surjective function given any function from x to z take any function there will be a function from f, f to a uh, function f to from y to z such that f twiddle followed by q this q is the one given by is equal to f if this thing happens it will happen that qx1 equal to qx2 would imply fx1 would have x2 not only that only if this condition happens there will be such a function f twiddle okay so so this is the picture here q is given x to y f is given here will there be a function here such that this diagram is commutative yes provided whenever x comma x x1 comma x2 go go to the same point here okay q of those two points must be the same here that is the whole idea sorry the other way q whenever q and q1 x1 and x2 go to same point here f of those points must be also the same so that is the criteria if there is such a thing it's clear that state two points here okay they are going to same point then f to the q will be the same point but that is f so that is necessary is clear Conversely, if that happens, all that I want to define f to the f to the I have defined from y to z. What do I do? Take up a point here. Okay, you can think of this as an equivalence class. Where is it? It is coming from Q of something. Take f of that to be f to the of this. That's all. So if y is Q of x, I will define f to the y to be f of x. That's all. Okay. so this is function theory this can be used in group theory can be used in vector spaces everywhere this is just function theory so we are going to use it in most general way namely for quotient maps okay it may be recalled that quotient maps are much more in some sense much more fragile are more general than what you get the quotient groups quotient groups are much more rigid okay so we will have some beautiful theorems about quotient quotient maps and quotient topologies and so on next time thank you